Taylor. We're going to just start Professor L, do just a small introduction in Spanish. Bueno, muy buenos días para todos. Es para mí un motivo de alegría saludarlos y darles la bienvenida al cuarto foro de Acoldes y Joven. Como fue anunciado, la, anima, la dinámica del evento será en inglés, con opción a una traducción simultánea en español. Eh, para hacer uso de la traducción simultánea, tendrán que eh, utilizar la app de Zoom, sea para computador o sea para dispositivo móvil. Es decir, que si nos acompañan desde la versión del navegador, o la versión online, no podrán hacer uso de la traducción simultánea. De igual manera, si nos acompañan por nuestro canal de YouTube, tampoco será posible utilizar la traducción simultánea. Para quienes deseen utilizarla, estará disponible en la parte de abajo de Zoom, donde hay tres puntos, se dice más, o more en inglés, dan la opción de interpretación, y podrán elegir si quieren escuchar los dos canales, es decir, en inglés, con la interpretación en español, eh, que nos acompañará Alejandro de Arte Medios, a quien le agradecemos acompañarnos el día de hoy y ya nos había acompañado en otro evento, o si tan solo desean eh, escuchar la interpretación en español. De igual manera, el evento tendrá una duración de aproximadamente una hora con un espacio de preguntas al final para la profesora. Eh, cualquier duda técnica la pueden escribir por el interno a la cuenta de Acoldese o me pueden escribir a mí. O de igual manera pueden enviar un correo electrónico a acoldeseaida.org. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, daremos inicio al evento. So, well, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us today. Be welcome to our fourth Young Acoldese Forum, where our association is such an honor to present today one special speaker, uh, Professor Francisca Arnold Dyer from the Queen Mary University of London. Um, let me introduce, first of all, uh, Professor Arnold Dyer. She's um, the director and she's a lecturer from the LLM Insurance Law Degree of the Queen Mary University of London. She's a lawyer from the University College of London. She's master in law from the UCL as well, and doctor PhD from the Queen Mary University of London. She's author of the book, The Insurable Interest and the Law, which was published over the last year. And she has advised the um, Law Commission for, of England and Scotland in the project to reform the insurable interest. This event will have a length of uh, approximately or estimated one hour and a little bit more. We'll have a space for Q and A's. At the end, Professor Arnold Dwyer, please be welcome. Thank you very much, Diego, for the uh, very kind introduction. And thank you and Akkordese for inviting me uh, to speak um, at one of your events. I feel really honored uh, to, to be here today. And I hope you find the talk interesting. Uh, I know that there is um, a simultaneous translation. So I will be speaking slowly. I'm also happy to take questions during my talk. But as Diego said, there will, be also, there will also be opportunity to ask questions at the end. So the topic of my talk today is insurable interest in English insurance law. And first of all, um, what is it when we talk about insurable interest? Well, it's, it's really hard to, to pin down because what an insurable interest is really depends on the kind of insurance contract you're talking about. So in property insurance, the insurable interest is what the relationship of the insured, the policyholder is with the insured property, the insured subject matter. Um, but in life insurance, the insurable interest uh, has to be considered in, in terms of the life that is being insured. And then the third big group of um, policies uh, is liability insurance. And in liability insurance, the insurable interest is the policyholder's exposure to the liability. So the fact that you can be held liable for a breach of contract or a tort, this exposure is considered to be the insurable interest. Now, insurable interest is probably as old as insurance. And certainly in English law, um, one can trace back um, mentions and um, sort of information on insurable interest 
to the uh, um, late um, 17th uh, century, but certainly from the early 18th century, it is very much a topic of conversation in Parliament. And the reason for that was that um, in the 18th century, England uh, became um, a powerful seafaring nation. So there was a lot of um, uh, shipping traffic. And with the shipping and the trade, uh, insurance became very important. And, um, but with insurance arrangements, um, there was also a lot of fraud. So um, there are parliamentary reports from the 18th century uh, which talk about how um, so fraudulent traders in London would um, buy insurance policies on, um, on ships um, they didn't own or had no interest in, uh, just to sort of um, bet on it. Or even worse, they would then enter into conspiracies with the master of the ship to have the ship sunk. So they would overvalue the ship, and an insurance policy um, uh, so, uh, somehow arrange for the uh, ship to sink and then cash in on the insurance claims. And insurance was also being used for tax evasion and uh, for all sorts of fraudulent practices. And in the uh, life insurance sector, there was also um, some sort of scandalous use of insurance going on. People would place bets on other people's lives, whether they um, would um, die within the next five years or uh, whether somebody would um, uh, give birth to boys or girls, that kind of betting was going on. And Parliament, the English Parliament didn't like it and they decided to put a stop to it. And this is how in um, 1746, we've got a first piece of what's basically insurance regulation. We have the Marine Insurance Act 1746, which says that contracts of marine insurance have to have an insurable interest. And then a few um, decades later, we have the same for life insurance, Life Insurance Act 1774, which requires an insurable interest in life insurance. And um, one of the curious things about insurable interest is that the Life Assurance Act 1774 is still in force today and is still the basis for insurable interest in life insurance. So this picture is just to give you an example of the kind of um, life insurance policies for as of betting contracts really that were entered into in, in these sort of early ages of insurance. So this guy here in the picture, he was the Chevalier Dion, but um, he was a spy and he had lived at the court of Catherine the Great, so the Russian czars, um, as a woman, so disguised as a woman. But then he moved to England and he um, was mostly dressed as a man, but sometimes he would also dress as a, as a woman. And um, um, a lot of people, it was of a pastime, considered a pastime in London, to put bets on, on, on this person, whether he was um, a man or a woman. And these bets were documented in life insurance contract policies. And two of these um, life insurance policies were actually litigated in court. And uh, so one, there's one case called Da Costa and Jones, so two parties completely unrelated to Chevalier Dion had basically betted um, 75 guineas um, that um, this person was a woman. And um, so for, for some reason there was a dispute, the matter went to court and it was the famous uh, English judge, Lord Mansfield, who was actually Scottish, but he was, a, he was in the English, he was a judge in the English courts who was um, really quite outraged that this kind of case should be coming uh, to the courts. That the, 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 and she said they're not matters that should be discussed in public. Um, this um, Chevalier Dion, he's entitled to his private life and it's outrageous uh, that completely unrelated people should take out life insurance policies 
um, on him or her. Um, yeah, so basically betting on, on um, whether he's a man or a woman. So this is of the background to why quite early on we've got uh, legislation requiring an insurable interest in English law. Um, but these legal of basis, they're really quite fragmented. So we've got um, different um, pieces of legislation for marine insurance and for life insurance. And then for non-marine goods and land and buildings, there is no specific piece of legislation, but we've got lots of case law, which makes it clear that an insurable interest is also required in contracts of insurance uh, regarding goods and land and buildings. And uh, for those of you who um, uh, don't know much about um, English law, uh, English law is basically um, a common law system where um, some of the laws are enshrined in legislation, so um, acts of parliament and um, uh, regulations made by the government. But also there are um, areas of law um, where the law is um, judge made. So where a dispute goes to court, the court makes a decision on a legal principle, and this then becomes a legal doctrine, and cases are um, sort of followed or overruled. So we also have this body of, of common law, which is um, judge-made law. And having this, um, sort of going back one slide, having this very fragmented um, sort of picture of um, what the legal basis are, this then also translates into a point in time when this insurable interest has to exist. Now, in marine insurance contracts, so insurance contracts that are concerned with insuring ships and insuring cargo that is being transported by sea, the insurable interest has to exist at the time of entering into the contract. Um, but also at the time of the loss. In non-marine property and land and buildings and liability insurance, um, you don't necessarily need an insurable interest right from the start, but you need to acquire an insurable interest during the time of the contract. And you certainly need one at the time there's a loss, because if at the time of the loss you don't have an insurable interest, you won't actually suffer loss and you won't be able to claim. And then for life insurance, um, the insurable interest requirement only applies at the time of entering into the contract, but it is um, then sort of later on, it's possible that uh, even if you lose the insurable interest, you still have a valid contract. So um, just looking at, sort of at, at the legal base and timing, you can see, I won't go through all the details of, of this table, but really this is just to give you um, a flavor of um, just how complicated the law on insurable interest has become because it goes back to the um, 18th century. There has been legislation, there has been case law. Um, so it's not actually easy to discern um, what the law is. It's really complex um, and um, there are lots of different rules for different types of um, insurance contracts. And um, one of the questions that often comes up in, an, uh, in insurance contracts is, well, is it okay for the parties to agree that an insurable interest is not needed? So can they waive the insurable interest requirement. And uh, this is a point of law which is being debated um, by, um, by, uh, by academics, so in legal commentary. Um, but in my personal opinion, I think the answer must be no, because insurable interest <clears throat> is a requirement for every contract of insurance and once you, <clears throat> excuse me, once you agree um, 
for on a contract that doesn't require an insurable interest. Really, what, what you're agreeing is not an insurance contract, but some kind of other contract of speculation. So in um, the book I've written on insurable interest, um, there, there's a lot of argument. I won't bore you with it, but uh, there's a lot of arguments I put forward um, why insurable interest cannot be raised. Right, um, then let's take a closer look on um, what insurable interest um, requires. So here we're looking at um, what kind of interest, what quality of interest um, would an insured and a policyholder have to demonstrate to establish to uh, show that he or she has an insurable interest. So we're looking at what is the relationship between the insured, the policyholder, and the subject matter of the insurance. And the best case scenario is that um, the policyholder has a legal interest. So the policyholder um, has an interest of ownership or a contractual right in the property that is being insured. So to give you an example, um, if um, I want to take out motor insurance. Um, I can insure my own car because I own it, but I cannot insure my neighbor's car because I don't have any property rights or any contractual rights to that car. So the legal interest um, is, is the paradigm, um, but increasingly, uh, the courts have also been looking at economic interests. Is an economic interest sufficient for an insurable interest? Is it enough that the insured is, is prejudiced by loss or damage to the insured subject matter? So to give you an example, um, you have, um, uh, I don't know, you have an ice cream stall um, which is um, where you have a sort of place where you sell your ice cream outside um, a big football stadium. Um, for example, in London, the Arsenal uh, football stadium. So you're outside um, with your ice cream cart and you have a really good business selling ice cream. Um, then one day, um, um, a, there's a big fire in the Arsenal football stadium. The Arsenal football stadium is, is damaged um, and uh, it's closed down for several months. Now you and your ice cream cart, you can still um, stand outside the stadium, you can still um, sell ice cream, but with the stadium closed, you're unlikely to have much custom. So you are suffering a loss, you've suffered a loss because the Arsenal football stadium has burned down, but you don't have a legal interest in the Arsenal Stadium. You don't own it. You don't have any property rights. Uh, you don't um, have any contractual rights. So the question is, is that kind of economic interest enough um, to um, make an insurance claim? And um, this is a contentious question under English law. And then when we look at um, insurable interest in marine insurance, we actually have a definition. So marine insurance is insurance of vessels, uh, freight and cargo. And there in section five, um, the, uh, def the definition insurable interest is defined as a um, person is interested in a marine adventure where he stands in any legal or equitable relation to the adventure or to any insurable property at risk therein, in consequence of which he may benefit by a CFT or the arrival of insurable property or may be prejudiced by its loss. So in relation to marine insurance, we've got a definition and the key ingredients there are the legal or equitable relation with the insured adventure and that you suffer a loss if something happens to it. And then we've got a, a third um, 
so we've got um, the category of non-marine insurance where, we, uh, where we've got so property, either personal property or land or buildings. And there the, um, uh, the legal interest test applies. Um, but there have also been cases um, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years um, which have expanded the, um, the test for insurable interest. Uh, so there have been cases that have said um, you don't need a strict legal interest. It can be enough to establish an, an insurable interest if you can show that you have enjoyment of property or management rights to the property or that you're somehow else involved with the property exam, for example, as a subcontractor working on a contract, uh, um, construction site. And uh, then for, for life insurance. So here we're talking about uh, taking out a policy of life insurance. You can obviously do that um, on your own life. So you have insurable interest in your own life. Um, the uh, law, the case law has also established um, that um, you have an insurable interest if you take out life insurance in the life of your spouse or partner or fiancé. And you can have an insurable interest in another person's life if there is some kind of monetary um, exposure. So for example, uh, uh, Diego owns me, uh, owes me a um, thousand pounds, uh, so he's borrowed money from me, then that would give me an insurable interest in his life um, because I know that I will only be repaid if he stays alive. And so th that would give me an insurable interest. However, um, English law is really quite strict. And there's no insurable interest, for example, in the life of your parents or in the life of your children or your grandparents or other relations. And so there's the, the categories of insurable interest in English law and life insurance are really limited to your own life, the life of, um, of a spouse or partner, and if there's a pecuniary interest, so monetary exposure. And it's really, um, this is really one of the uh, main reasons why um, in the last 10 years or so, insurable interest has really um, come, um, has been criticized a lot and has, um, and especially for being so um, almost of outdated, antiquated and in need of reform. Um, because we've got this really messy area of law with lots of different categories and lots of different legal bases, so it's messy. But in relation to life insurance, it has also been said, really, the uh, existing categories of life insurance, they're too narrow and they're not helpful for modern life. Yeah, so in terms of uh, how people live these days, um, where we um, have to look after aging parents or um, um, grandparents want to make an investment for grandchildren with life insurance policies. They are all useful um, products, but under English law, there's always a question mark, but are they going to be valid? Because the um, categories of life insurance um, in strict black letter law are really quite limited. So for, for all these um, reasons, um, insurable interest um, has been uh, criticized um, in academic writing, um, but also by the courts in, in other uh, jurisdictions, for example, in, in Canada. And um, there are other common law jurisdictions uh, like Australian law and also US law. Um, who that have either done away with the insurable interest requirement completely, like Australian law, or what we see in the US, um, they've just um, made the definition of insurable interest wider, so they've expanded the categories to make it easier for policyholders 
to demonstrate an insurable interest. Now, what have the English courts done? Well, the English courts um, are, of course, um, limited by um, the legislation which is in place. So the, the courts cannot rule acts of parliament. And also English courts are bound by their own precedent. So the English courts have been um, just very incremental in sort of bit by bit, sort of gnawing away on insurable interest, making it wider, making it a little bit more flexible. Um, but they haven't been able to simply do away with it. Um, so uh, a few years ago, the Law Commission, which is the um, law reform agency in, in the United Kingdom, the Law Commission had a um, big project of reforming insurance contract law. Some of these reforms have already um, come into force through new law. And insurable interest has been one of the areas they've been looking at. Um, but um, no reforms have been um, sort, of, uh, sort of enacted in legislation yet. And I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. But really what, um, uh, what I um, wanted to examine in, in my book is to look at um, whether insurable interest um, has still a role to play in the 21st century. And the reason I wanted to look at is that um, the uh, English law we've got, as I told you, is really quite old. Um, it's, it's messy and some people say it's, not, it's no longer fit for purpose in a modern world. Um, so uh, what I did was I looked at the uh, rationales, so the reasons for insurable interest, and um, examined whether they still apply today. And the three rationales for insurable interest are, um, and I'll explain them um, in more detail in a minute, the anti-wagering rationale, the moral hazard rationale, and also the interconnectedness rationale. So, um, when we um, talk about the anti-wagering rationale, what, we, what we're saying is that we need the doctrine of insurable interest because the, it's the insurable interest that distinguishes insurance contract from other types of contracts of speculation. So it's a dividing line between insurance and gambling. And this goes right back to these early cases in the 18th century where people were, were people using um, insurance policies as, as instruments of betting and instruments of fraud. Now, um, some uh, very, very eminent academics in the United Kingdom have said, well, we don't really need insurable interest uh, to draw this distinction because betting is no longer an activity that's, that's outlawed. It's now legal. So um, in, uh, in the UK, um, betting is legitimate. But also they, they say, um, in any event, um, insurable interest is, is not the right um, instrument uh, to regulate the distinction between betting and insurance. It, it, ca it can be done by other regulatory interventions. Um, but um, when, when I thought about this anti wagering rationale, um, it sort of occurred to me that it's, it's no longer really about um, sort of stopping policyholders from, from gambling under the guise of insurance. What we really want to do with insurable interest now is to stop insurers from gambling. Yeah? Insurers are regulated um, and supervised authorities. So they are um, in the UK, they're um, regulated by the uh, Prudential Regulation Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority. And as um, insurers are in charge of lots of money, policyholder funds, um, which they need to retain so that when claims come in, they are sufficiently liquid and solvent that claims can be paid. 
So we don't want insurance companies um, to enter into gambling contracts. We want them to enter into proper insurance contracts. And um, there's one um, example of um, insurers gambling and um, not entering into insurance contracts, but into other kinds of um, contracts of speculation in the not too distant um, past. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I know you're the, uh, the young insurance lawyer group. So, um, but back in 2008 in the financial crisis, um, one of the um, financial institutions that were um, most endangered by um, uh, financial instability uh, was AIG. And um, AIG at the time, they had, um, in addition to their sort of traditional insurance business, they had um, um, sort of big um, financial investments in uh, sort of credit default swaps and derivatives. So they were the kind of contracts of speculation where no insurable interest is required. And it, it was these kinds of contracts um, that really got them into financial difficulties. So I think um, that um, there is still a rationale for um, an insurable interest, but unlike in the 18th century, where it was about um, uh, stopping policyholders from, from betting and from gambling. Um, I think now it is uh, that insurable interest is a useful mechanism uh, to keep insurers in check. And then the next rationale I mentioned uh, was the moral hazard rationale. And um, so traditionally, uh, what we've meant by that is that um, uh, that um, an, a policyholder who has an insurable interest in any in property he insures, he or she insures, they're less likely um, to damage or destroy that property in order to make an insurance claim. Whereas if you take out insurance um, on something you don't actually own, you may be tempted uh, to destroy it um, in order to cash in on the insurance claim. And um, so there's, um, there's quite a bit of academic fighting on this point, um, which uh, seeks to show um, that um, the, the small hazard um, rationale um, doesn't make any sense. For example, uh, Professor Davy, um, who's an insurance law professor in, in England, um, has carried out a study um, about murders, homicides, and um, he found in his statistics uh, that lots of spouses, so um, Kill, kill the other half. So in many of the murderers in, in the UK, the murderer is, is the spouse. Now, spouses, of course, would have an insurable interest for life insurance purposes. So we don't know whether these murderers had life insurance, but, but we know that being, that being a spouse doesn't stop you from, from murdering the other half. Quite to the, to the contrary, it, um, <laughs> it, it might um, it might um, be might be the reason, and uh, there are also other commentators um, who've said uh, that even if insurable interest can serve to reduce moral hazard, it's not the right instrument. So um, murder and fraud and um, criminal damage to property should be uh, regulated by by criminal law and not by a private law doctrine of insurable interest. So now when, when I looked at uh, moral hazard, I thought um, that maybe rather than looking at whether insurable interest can reduce um, the temptation to destroy property, uh, another way of looking at it is that 
if you have an insurable interest in a property that is being insured, you've got skin in the game. Yeah, so even with insurance, think about um, your car and having car insurance. Even so you have insurance, you don't want anything to happen to your car because you know it's going to be hassle to make a claim. It will take time. You have to have it repaired. There'll be um, an excess, so you won't get all your money back. Your insurance premium will, will go up. So by reason um, of having an um, insurable interest in your car, you, you don't want anything to happen to your car, even though you've got insurance. So in that sense, there's an alignment of interest. Both you as the policyholder and the insurer, it would be in both your best interest if nothing happened to the car. So this is what I mean by skin in the game and an alignment of interest. And um, then uh, finally, the interconnectedness argument. Um, so here we're looking at um, the argument that uh, for indemnity insurance, um, some um, academics have said that um, uh, insurable interest is redundant and superfluous because indemnity insurance um, already only works um, that you get claims paid if you have suffered a loss. And you can't suffer loss unless you have some kind of exposure. And therefore, you don't need to have this insurable interest on, on top of it. All you need is the um, principle of, of indemnity. Um, but in, in my um, research, um, I've examined that and um, I found um, that the um, principle of indemnity uh, is not freestanding, but that in fact, insurable interest is connected to many other doctrines and principles of insurance law. So it's, it's connected uh, to the indemnity principle, it's connected to subrogation, um, but it's also um, a key part of other um, sort of policy terms and duties in connection with, with insurance contracts. So for example, if you think about um, the uh, uh, pre-contractual risk um, presentation, so the information that the insurer, the, the policyholder gives to the insurer before they enter into the contract. Now, if you just think about the car example, if you're not the owner of the car, you won't, you won't have that information, yeah? You won't be able to um, tell, or you're unlikely to be able to have the information to tell the insurer um, what mileage the car has, uh, whether it has had any accidents recently, um, how old it is, um, and all that kind of information. So insurable interest is also <coughs> connected uh, <coughs> to to other principles of insurance law, because um, basically it's only if you are um, the owner of property or have some other kinds of rights of control and access um, that you have the relevant information, but also um, that allows you to be in a position um, to, to look after the property. And of course, that's another important part of insurance policies there will be obligations and warranties um, requiring you to deal with your property in a particular way. And um, if you're not the owner, uh, if you're not um, in possession or in control, then you won't be able to comply with those terms. So um, basically in, in conclusion, um, I found um, lots of reasons uh, why insurable interest is uh, still relevant in the 21st century, uh, why we still need it, and um, why it shouldn't be abolished, and uh, why it is in fact a very useful tool uh, for both the um, insured and the insurer alike um, to um, ensure 
the smooth running um, of an insurance contract. So, um, and with that, I come back to the Law Commission's uh, reform proposals I mentioned earlier. So the um, latest state of play there is that um, the Law Commission has put forward um, an insurable interest bill. So a bill is not yet legislation, but it's basically a draft that Parliament is going to look at. And um, what the Law Commission is proposing is uh, to make the categories of insurable interest uh, for life insurance wider so that it's going to be easier for um, uh, families, other family relationship other than just um, wife and husband and uh, fiancés and other partners uh, to take out life insurance. Um, but they dropped their um, original plans of abolishing insurable interest for non-life insurance, so for property insurance. And they basically, um, having consulted with the insurance industry, they realized just what a um, sort of integral um, part insurable interest is of an insurance contract. So they abandoned um, their plans to get rid of insurable interest for non-life insurance. And uh, so this insurable interest bill is just to provide any categories of insurable interest in life insurance. And um, insurable interest as, as, as relates to marine and non-marine property um, will um, remain untouched, so exactly as it is, um, as I have described, um, which is, of course, um, from, as I see it, a good thing from um, retaining insurable interest, but it's also a missed opportunity of, um, of tidying up the law, because we're still um, stuck um, with a body of um, case law and uh, legislation dating back to the 18th century, uh, which makes the legal framework for insurable interest um, quite fragmented and, and complex. So um, that brings me to the end of, of my talk on law. I just wanted um, to um, mention the institution where I teach, which is uh, Queen Mary University of London, and there's a Center for Commercial Law Studies. And uh, we are basically a postgraduate um, uh, center for, for um, uh, teaching and research. And uh, we've got, um, every year we've got um, sort of between 700 and 1,000 um, LLM students uh, studying with us. And we've got a very um, wide range of postgraduate law um, modules including um, the insurance law LLM, which I'm teaching. And so part of, of that insurance law LLM, the modules are uh, general principles of insurance law, insurance contracts, insurance regulation, reinsurance, and international risk transfer. So um, with that, um, I um, um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I might just... Um, stop sharing and um, I'd be very happy to um, to take questions. Thank you, Professor Arnold Breyer, for this fantastic and phenomenal presentation. It's, it's really uh, so interesting uh, to know the historical part, the development and the current debate around the insurable interest in the UK. Thank you so much for this. Uh, well, as announced before, I think we'll take at least a five minutes break. I will um, ask our guests and the attendees, if you may have any question, please write it on the chat. You can send it also to the other channels of our association and we'll uh, answer them in some few minutes. So a five minutes break so that our interpreter can rest a little bit and we'll be back. Okay.
Bueno, un saludo especial para todos los que nos acompañan. Estamos en un, en un break. Los invitamos a seguir enviando sus preguntas por medio de nuestro chat o por la parte de, de preguntas de la aplicación de Zoom. En un momento la profesora Arnold Bayer nos eh, responderá las que alcancemos a responder. Or oh, maybe somebody wants to um, uh, tell me about uh, Colombian law on uninsurable interest. <laughs> well, I can try. <laughs> I can try. Actually, I don't know, Professor, if you just read in our chat, there was a special greeting for you from our friends in Costa Rica, Juan Jose, who was one of our classmates. They are yeah, I saw it. Yes. Today. Yeah. Hello, Juan. Nice, nice to hear from you. <laughs> So we'll give just some time. Uh, again, for everyone who is with us, uh, please keep uh, sending your questions. We'll try to answer them all as the time let us do it. Well, for, for your question, Professor, here, the insurable interest uh, well, was established in our commercial code as one of the main elements of our insurance uh, contract. And following these, uh, rationale of the civil uh, code for the entire uh, contracts law, uh, when one of these main elements is missing, in theory, we will not be facing that type of contract. Mm -hmm. Then actually it's an existence requirement as well as an execution requirement. It, it must be there an, an entire time, but our legislation does not uh, distinguish between, for example, type of insurances or the moments where it must be shown there well, we, we just don't. Uh, there is some few rulings, of course, about the insurable interest, but more of being needed to be in face of an insurance contract, but not, uh, for example, for distinguishing or ha or which will be exactly the effect um, of uh, disappearing in a moment and being back, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. is very common. That's uh, the right thing practice that, for example, in the property insurance policies, sometimes they just uh, get confused between the subject matter of the insurance mm -hmm. and the insurable interest. So mm -hmm. it is very fun to see in some property policies that they point out as insurable interest, the property that is being insured. But well, I think it's more like a vocabulary issue. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just start with the questions, right? So the first of them is one that is in our chat that says from Tatiana Rincon, if suicide can be understood as a moral hazard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this, is, um, this is sort of the kind of moral hazard um, insured interest um, where some people would say, well, yes, you have an insurable interest in your own life, um, but you can take your own life, suicide, and would it still work because you had an insurable interest? And the answer to that is um, that um, the problem would not be the insurable interest, um, but the problem would be that um, uh, many life policies have a so-called um, suicide clause, um, which would um, prevent you from coverage um, if you kill yourself as any first two years. Because then it's, um, it's kind of thought that you took out the insurance policies precisely with the purpose of um, um, so the, the claim being paid to your, to your family. So this is, this is the problem, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. So Marcio Malfatti uh, from Brazil, his, uh, his question is the following, I will try to translate it. So in property insurances, uh, where there's like um, a rent of a property, mm -hmm. uh, there is an insurable interest of the owner and the one who is renting the yeah. property. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what happens when there is fraud without the participation of the owner? Uh, how the claim will be regulated for everyone? Uh, is there like any question or does this raise any question of the insurable interest? Yeah, so um, this, um... Vented property. So we've got the landlord who owns the property, and we've got the tenant who's renting the property. And both the landlord and the tenant will have an insurable interest. So they would both be capable of taking out insurance on the property in their own right. Now, the question is how can you um, prevent uh, double recovery? so that um, both the, um, the tenant and the landlord um, make an insurance claim. And um, the, uh, the way this is usually regulated is that in the um, tenancy agreement, um, the obligation to insure um, will be uh, specifically on either the landlord or the tenant. And um, even if they had separate insurance policies in place, the insurer would want to see um, proof of loss. So they would want to see what actually is, is the loss that has been suffered. And uh, through those mechanisms, um, you, would, um, you would avoid double recovery. All right, thank you for your answer, Professor. Another question is from Juan Delgado. We said, thanks for the conference. Why are the legal consequences in the UK law when there is no insurable interest, nullity, mm -hmm. non-existence of the contract? Yeah, no, this, <laughs> this is one of, of the tricky areas. And I'm, I'm sorry, maybe just uh, should go back to my, to my slides. I didn't want to bore you with too much, too much detail. But um, the um, effect of uh, lack of insurable interest is also one of the areas um, that is so tricky. Now, um, in relation to marine insurance contracts, uh, the answer is relatively straightforward. The contract is void. So a contract of marine insurance, the, insured, the policyholder has no insurable interest. This contract is void, which means it's treated as if it doesn't exist. Um, the same applies to life insurance. So um, a contract of life insurance without um, insurable interest is void. And then we've got um, other categories like non-marine goods and land and buildings where the situation is less clear cut, um, where we have some jurisprudence to say that the whole contract is void, but there are also some cases which suggest that it's simply the, the insurance claim that is unenforceable. So the contract still subsists, possibly as some other kind of contract, not necessarily an insurance contract, um, but the, uh, um, the claim will be unenforceable. And then there's another issue with the consequences, which is, um, is the insurer, is, has, does the insurer have to pay back the premium? So um, imagine you've entered into a contract of insurance. There's an insurable interest problem. So the contract is void. Um, then of course the, the insurer hasn't earned the premium. He hasn't been on risk. And you would think um, that that should mean that the insurer also has to give back the premium. Um, however, there are some old cases in relation to life insurance, um, which suggest which is really quite harsh, uh, which suggests that, that the premium is not returnable. So not only does the uh, policyholder not have a valid contract of insurance, um, they've also lost their premium. And that seems hugely unfair and it's one of the areas that has been criticized. All right, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, it is not very easy to know in which, like, there's no an only or unique uh, answer, right? It, it depends on yeah. what type of insurance we're talking about. And mm -hmm. I think this is one slide that we must keep uh, yeah, reviewing um, so many times. I can send the stack of slides to you if you want to post them or circulate them. Thank That's you. Thank you.
Yeah, that will be very useful, I'm sure, for our members and attendees. Mm -hmm. I think here there is another question from Silvia Cabrera. She asks, why the English law does not recognize the direct action against the insurance company by the insured party in the maritime damages, but it is available in the road traffic accidents? A direct action by the um, by a third party. Yeah, against yeah. the insurer. Mm -hmm. In the insurer, yeah. sorry. It's, we've got uh, English contract law, and this is a principle of general contract law. Uh, it's called privity of contract. So a contract can only be enforced um, by the parties to the contract, and a third party who is not part of the contract, generally speaking, they cannot. They cannot um, enforce a right, even if the contract uh, seeks to benefit a third party. Now, um, this um, doctrine of of contract um, has now started to sort of be eroded a little bit. There's something something called this um, rights of third parties act. Um, which allows um, third parties who are not parties to the contract under certain conditions um, to claim directly against a contract party. But th th these are very specific um, and circumscribed conditions. And so this doctrine of privity also applies to insurance contracts so that primarily um, if there's an insurance claim, it is between uh, the um, policyholder and the insurer, unless the contract, the insurance contract, makes express provisions for that uh, a third party is entitled to claim. And um, this is actually quite common in commercial transactions where um, you can um, basically provide an um, insurance policy um, that um, a third party is a loss payee. And um, so, for example, you, you find that where um, uh, um, there's, a, there's a property on which a bank has a mortgage, so a charge, then the owner of the property will take out um, an insurance policy on a property. Um, but the bank, because the bank is still owed money, um, they will want to um, have a claim on the insurance proceeds in case something happens to the property. Um, so they can either do that by um, insuring in their own right, because they would have insured the interest um, as a mortgagee of the property, or they can simply ask um, for the policy insurance policy to note that the bank is, is, is a loss payee, so that any claims um, that are paid by the insurer are paid to the bank directly. All right. Thank you so much, Professor, for that uh, answer. Uh, I understand here in Colombia the privity doctrine uh, between the parties of the contract is also the same. Like it's a general rule. Actually, we insurance contract we needed a special rule and statutory yeah. rule that allowed the third party to claim. They're directly only in liability insurance, of course. But it makes, it makes sense um, in, in some insurance situations, um, as for example, this motor insurance, um, where you want to, to compensate the victim, the third party directly, and you don't want to risk money being paid to the policyholder first, and maybe they're just going to use up the money without the victim ever receiving compensation. So, and there's a special exception for that in English insurance contract law too. So, but they are very specific situations. Is it a statutory uh, rule or uh, it was right. more like, was it uh, established through the statuto statutory rule or it was more like a case law? I know uh, that's in the Road, Road Traffic Act. The Road that's Traffic Act. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. This is a personal question, like, after all this debate and after all your study over this topic, which would you think it's the current main challenge of the insurable interest? Like, yeah, yeah which um, lessons will, can, can we learn from all what happened? Like, which lessons can other jurisdictions learn from the UK experience? Yeah. 
So in um, most insurance contracts, um, the kind of insurance contracts we come across as, as consumers, as private persons, um, insurable interest is not a problem, except in life insurance, where it would be better to make provisions for your family and to, in terms of financial planning, to have, um, to have wider, more flexible categories. However, where insurable interest is really critical is um, in the financial markets. So in um, terms of distinguishing, say, between um, credit risk insurance and uh, credit default swaps or derivatives, um, the notion of insurable interest has assumed a really key role. So if you want your contract to be insurance, you make sure you have an insurable interest. But if um, you're, say, you're a bank, you don't have an insurance license, and you have lots of financial instruments that operate as credit default swaps, you don't want your regulator to think that this is an insurance contract. So what you do is you write into your document specifically that no insurable interest is required. So in the financial markets, insurable interest um, is a key differentiator between insurance contracts and other contracts of speculation. And the other area where insurable interest um, is um, sort of, of, um, of topicality and potentially of concern is in relation to um, insurance-linked securities. So where um, the, uh, um, you've got um, a risk transfer, but um, the uh, um, con contract is structured in a way that um, the payment is not necessarily an indemnity payment, but could be triggered by parametric triggers. And also your, um, the, the loss payout is not measured on your actual loss, but could be determined by a pre-existing formula. And you see that a lot in relation to um, natural catastrophes, um, source of cat bonds. And um, so there the question is, once you take out um, sort of the requirement for having to prove a loss and you don't have an indemnity trigger, and you can't show um, an insurable interest, is, is that kind of risk transfer, is that still insurance or is it something else? And um, this question <laughs> has also been answered in, in, in the UK, not by the courts and not by determining whether this is an insurance contract, but by parliament introducing specific regulations, the risk transformation regulations, um, which allow that kind of parametric um, risk transfer arrangement as a separate kind of contract, a risk transformation contract. So yes. if I did understand the parametric uh, mechanisms are not considered like insurance contracts since they don't have insurable interests, I mean, this yeah, risk, so the, yeah. this uh, act, could, sorry. Go, go for it. So insurable interest could be a problem, um, but um, there's now this separate category, risk transformation, for which insurance companies can get um, a separate authorization. So it's like an extra permission on their license. And um, uh, so once they're authorized for also carrying out risk transformation activities, um, then this shouldn't be a problem. So this way, Parliament has solved without actually having to decide whether these parametric insurances are insurance or not. They've yeah. simply decided we're going to allow insurers to do these contracts anyway if they have this extra permission. All right. Thank you so much. Very interesting yeah. um, to be followed and review here because they recently had like this discussion also around the parametric insurances here in Colombia, especially for. Um, crop insurance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very well uh, after reviewing the rationales of your book like um, do you consider important to keep distinguishing between non-marine marine and life insurances 
Um, I think there is a case to be made to distinguish between life insurance and non-life insurance. Um, but I think uh, once you're outside life insurance, the English law is really messy and should be tidied up to make it more coherent and neat. But the reason I'm saying life insurance is separate is because um, life insurance is not a contract of indemnity. You can't measure the value of life, any loss of life. Um, and, and therefore, um, life insurance needs to be treated differently. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. In our jurisdiction, uh, for fighting this moral hazard that was compressed in your um, moral hazard rational, like um, this, the expression of having a skin in the game uh, mm -hmm. to avoid fraudulent claims, etc. Et Here is more uh, seen uh, very linked to the deductible meca mechanism, like mm -hmm. having some part of your indemnity reduced. Yeah, yeah. So you know you will never be fully compensated or, yeah, uh, yeah right? So. Yeah. That what do you very, think about it? Do you think the shareable interest factor will be even more important than this deductible mechanism? Yeah, this, is a, this is a really good point. And deductibles um, is a really good example of skin in the game. Um, and I have considered that. And um, what I am saying is that um, a deductible only works and a deductible only makes sense if you have an insurable interest in the first place. So think back about to the car examples. Um, if you don't own the car, the car is damaged or destroyed, then um, having to sort of bear part of the cost of repair doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't apply to you. Because if you don't own the car, you won't be paying for the repair of it. So even um, a deductible only makes sense if you actually have the insurable interest that creates the exposure. So in theory, the insurable interest will be a requirement for being able to apply to someone a deductible in some yeah, way. Yeah, so without, without an insurable interest, the deductible is meaningless. All right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Well, maybe just uh, another question will be, what about the insurable interest in the reinsurance? Because in, uh, in our jurisdiction, for example, they just said, like, the insurance um, contract uh, rules will apply to a reinsurance contract, but they just don't, do not specify that. And it always caught my attention when uh, we did review in our classes, the Marine Insurance Act, that there is a specific provision of that says, more or less, I do not remember it a lot, that the reinsurer will always have interest in all the risk he reinsures, right? Something like that. But, and I find it a very good um, yeah. solution. Will you explain the explain yeah. us this a little bit, please? Yeah, launching me on, on another one of my favorite um, topics, which is reinsurance law. And it's a really good question because in um, certainly in English reinsurance law, there is an ongoing debate on whether the nature of reinsurance is that it's um, almost like a further insurance on the underlying insurance subject matter, or whether the insurance is simply about um, indemnifying for the reinsurance liability. So what's the nature of reinsurance? And this then has an impact on how you look at insurable interest. And the latest um, consideration of this matter has been in a, in a case um, decided by the House of Lords, um, maybe about 10 years ago, called Baza and Lexington, where the House of Lords said, which is the highest court in, in the UK, which where the House of Lords said, the subject matter of a reinsurance contract, the nature of reinsurance, is simply a further insurance of the underlying insured subject matter which for insurable interest means that the insurable interest in a reinsurance contract is not the um, reinsurance liability to pay claims, but the um, insurable interest is actually the interest in the underlying insured subject matter, which um, sounds very theoretical, but it has actually a practical implication, which is that um, if there's a problem with insurable interest in the underlying insurance contract, 
this has an immediate repercussion on the reinsurance contract. So basically, if you don't have an insurable interest in the underlying contract, then there's no insurable interest in the reinsurance contract either. And which rules will apply to this reinsurance contract? Like the ones of marine risk, non marine risk, land buildings, or it depends also in the nature of the yeah. underlying insurance contract, right? Yeah, so you would, you would look at the underlying contract, the, the rules for the underlying contract. And that makes it even trickier, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor, our last questions, and this is a question we make to uh, every of our special uh, speakers, and is, well, a part of your book, of course, which is uh, available to everyone in uh, an ebook version, which book will you recommend to our attendees uh, if any of them would like to go a little bit deeper in this insurable interest subject? Okay, so um, the uh, standard textbook on English insurance law is a book called um, McGillifray on Insurance Law. Um, it's it's very um, it's quite expensive because it's a practitioner's textbook, and it's also quite detailed. So it's um, it's not an easy book to read, um, but uh, it's probably the best one for a really comprehensive overview. So. All right, thank you so much. They are asking us from Brazil if you uh, can share us the link of your book or just give us the general information about it so anyone can uh, buy it and look for it if they want. Yeah, so um, uh, once I um, sent around um, the slides, um, you, you'll see um, details of my book, which is, I don't know whether you can still see my screen. Uh, so this is my yes, book. And then I've also got a um, second book, the, the Law of Reinsurance. And I let me just have a look. I, I think. No, it's not in here. Um, but I can I can include um, details of my other book as well if it's of interest. But I didn't want to come across as a salesperson. <laughs> so it's, but, yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. Thank you so much. So uh, you all guys have it there: the insurable interest and the law by Francis Cardinal Dwyer. You can find it online. Uh, I found it before in an mm -hmm. ebook version and is very, very good. Uh, so thank you, Professor Arnold Dwyer, for this time. It was a wonderful um, space. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. So we had so much fun. To all who were here, thank you for having joined join us. Uh, it was great to share this topic. We hope to see you again in, a, in another event. And of course, uh, we expect uh, Professor Arnold Dwyer to visit Colombia sometimes so we can speak about this subject again. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our interpreter, Alejandro, and Ismael, who was in our technical staff uh, with us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Have very a great much day. for inviting me. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye, Professor.